Awesome. So we are going to be in John 8, uh, 25 and 30 through 30. Normally I have the middle schoolers raise their hand when they're there, but I trust you can find it this morning. All right. So John 8, verse 25 in the NLT says it like this. Who are you? They demanded. Jesus replied, the one I have always claimed to be. I have much to say about you and much to condemn, but I won't. For I say only what I have heard from the one who sent me, and he is completely truthful. But they still didn't understand that he was talking about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the son of man on the cross, then you will understand that I am he. I do nothing on my own, but say only what the father taught me. And the one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. Then many who heard him say these things believed in him. Amen. Can you guys welcome me? Join me in welcoming Pastor Austin. Woo! Good morning. Good to see you guys as always. Uh, If you would, join with me in prayer as we kick this thing off. Father, we thank you for your presence here with us. Uh, Even in troubled times, we can go through life without without a troubled heart. So Jesus, I thank you for your peace that's here, your presence that's here, and that as we surrender our lives to you, as we keep putting our lives up on the altar of surrender, that you would continue to shape us and form us into your image, that we would live our lives shaped by Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we've been talking about our thoughts and we're going to be continuing on that. And I'm curious if you have ever found yourself doing the right things, but the right things just don't seem to be working for you. Okay. The things that seem to work for other people just don't seem to be working for you. Maybe you have a friend who started this particular diet and they lost like 50 pounds in six months. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So you go to to them and you ask, Hey, what'd you do? They tell you exactly what they did. You know, their, their exact diet, their exact exercise routine, whatever. And so you're thinking, okay, I'm going to do it. This is my time. So after a week of starving yourself, And doing everything that they did, you get on the scale to realize you're not getting the same results, okay? And you start to think, maybe starving myself isn't working. I'm going back to to my my buffet, okay? (laughs) I've mentioned before how I really enjoy backpacking. I love almost everything about being up in the mountains, except for sleeping. I, I sleep just horrendously. While I'm, while I'm backpacking. And meanwhile, the guys around me, like within minutes of getting into our tent, they start taunting me with their snoring. <laughs> and I used to think that maybe this is, you know, maybe I'm exaggerating it. Maybe it's really not that bad. Maybe I'm only awake for like 30 minutes throughout the night and it just feels like forever. Except this year I, I wore a watch that that can track my sleep. And so I have quantifiable evidence on just how poorly I sleep. And so I want to show you this. Here's what you're looking at. The blue is when I'm asleep and the orange is when I'm awake. And so, uh, yeah, there, there was like three hours in the middle of that night whenever I'm just wide awake. And I go to the, the guys who are having success sleeping easily. And I ask them, you know, what are you doing? And they tell me, they said, you know, I, one guy's like, I just reflect on the events from the day. And I just kind of go through the day in my mind and it just puts me to sleep. And Pastor Jacob's probably just like reciting the entire book of Genesis, <laughs> putting himself to sleep. And I'm like, you guys are lying to me. This is not what you do. You are sneaking in a bottle of something and uh, like Benadryl, you know, or something like that, people. Because I'm like, I am doing the things that y'all are telling me to do, but it looks like that for me, you know? And I'm curious what, it, like, how it plays out when it comes to your faith. 
Like, when it comes to this Christianity thing, do you find yourself at times doing the things that you know to be are the right things to do, but they just don't seem to be working for you? You know, you look at other people and they're doing the same things. We can take that off the screen now. <laughs> That's just, I, I've got to be encouraged as I minister and every time I see that, it just beats me down. Okay. Uh, but when it comes to the things of the faith, you may, be, uh, you may be with somebody who it's just like they're always hearing God speak to them and you can see in their life, they're just growing in maturity and spiritual maturity and they're becoming more and more like Jesus and they're walking in peace and you ask them what they're doing and you're doing all the same things, but yet you're not getting the same results. And so you begin to ask yourself, is this thing even working? Like, does this thing really work? And I don't know about you, but oftentimes whenever I'm in a situation like this, whenever I'm trying to figure out why something's not working, what I start thinking about is, what am I doing that I need to stop doing? And what am I not doing that I need to start doing? I immediately go to the doing. Well, when we want to change, instead of starting by focusing on what we're doing, we're going to focus on what we're thinking, okay? Because our lives move in the direction of our strongest thoughts. This is why Proverbs 4.23, this is what we've been talking about. Be careful how you think for your life is shaped by your thoughts. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. And for those of us who have surrendered our lives to Jesus, who are following after him, our aim in life is to live lives that are formed, that are shaped into the image of Jesus, that we live our lives doing the things we do, raising the children we raise, working at the job that we work at, that we do those things as Jesus would do them if he were in our shoes. That is the aim of discipleship and following Jesus is to live our lives as he would, that our lives take on the shape of Jesus. And if you want to live like Jesus, you have to think like Jesus. If you want to live like him, you have to think like him because our actions don't come out of nowhere. Our actions are a product of our thinking, okay? Every habit, every action, the shape of your life, all of it finds its root, finds its origin in your thoughts. So if we want to live like Jesus, we need to think like Jesus. And there are, there are forces in the world that are always trying to shape you and form you. You are going to become someone you know, this is why in Romans 12, Paul says, don't be conformed to the ways of this world, to the image of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, we stay stuck by the neglecting of our mind. So if we want to live like Jesus, we have to think like Jesus, which may seem like an impossible task, but it's not. 1 Peter 4, 7 in the message, Peter writes this, since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more, learn to think like him. Jesus knows what it's like to be tired. Jesus knows what it's like to experience stress. Jesus knows what it's like to experience sorrow and grief and loss of someone that you love. Jesus knows what it's like to have someone hate you. He knows what it's like to be deserted. He knows, he's been through everything that you've been through and more. And so learn to think like him. And this process of learning to think like Jesus is what the scripture refers to as the renewal of your mind that we begin to think like Jesus. And as we think like him, we are transformed into his image, which is our mission as a church, is to see people transformed by Jesus. And we do this by learning to think like him. So today I wanna look at four different mindsets that we see from Jesus. Um, and we're going to, to get these because there's, there's a million different things that you could look at when it comes to how Jesus thought, 
but we're going to frame it around Jesus's response that we read earlier that Joseph read for us from John chapter eight. So Jesus is asked this question. He's kind of causing this scene, you know, like Jesus typically does. And thanks for thinking that was funny, babe. I appreciate that. That wasn't really supposed to be a joke, but this is a trick to a good marriage, marriage tip, laugh at one another or with one another, sometimes at one another, you know, keep it, keep it light. Um, but Jesus is causing a scene and the people around him start wondering, who is this guy? And so they're asking, is he a prophet? Is he, do you think he might be the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for that's gonna come and set our people free? Do you think he's just another one of those guys that's trying to, you know, get everyone to back his cause and uh, he's just gonna end up being uh, a nobody like the rest of them? Who is this guy? And so one of them finally gets the courage and goes up to Jesus and asks him point blank, who are you? And Jesus gives him a response. And from the response of Jesus answering the question of who he is, there are a few mindsets that we can see, a few ways of thinking that we're going to uh, frame this message around. Because again, you can look at so many different things, but we're going to look at these four mindsets. And we're going to look at these through the lens of, if this is how Jesus thought, where am I on this? How am I doing with this way of thinking? So the first mindset we're going to look at is what I'm going to call the identity mindset. In Jesus's response are the words, I am. Jesus knew exactly who he was. He had a strong sense of identity. How many times in scripture do we see Jesus uttering those words? I am the bread of life, John 6. I am the light of the world. I am the son of man. Before Abraham was, I am. You want to talk about, that was, a, that was a mic drop moment. Had to be. Like, that was one of those moments where when Jesus said that, everyone's jaws probably hit the floor. Uh, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the son of God. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine and you are the branches. I am gentle and lonely in heart. Do you get the picture here? Okay. Jesus knew exactly who he was. Do you? Do you know who you are? What do you fill in the blank with, with this statement? I am, okay, in school, I hated fill in the blank answers. I liked multiple choice, okay? Because with fill in the blank, you actually have to know the answer. Uh, With multiple choice, you could just guess it. Well, what do you fill in this blank with? with I am, because what you fill in that blank with matters way more than you probably are aware of. And we fill in that blank all the time. You know, I, I want to get up. I know that it's important to, to get up and, and to start the day out right, but I'm just not a morning person. I want to get alone with God because I, I think that that's important, but I'm too busy. I want to connect with other people because I think relationships are valuable, but I'm not good with people. I want to start a business. I feel like God's telling me to do that, but I'm not good with numbers. Like how many times do we fill in that blank with something? I want to share my faith, but I'm too shy. I want to play for the Texas Rangers, but I'm too old and out of shape. That's okay. The Cowboys could probably use your help. I'm sorry. But I think so often there are things that God desires for us to step into, plans and purposes that he has for our lives that never get their feet under them never get a chance to gain traction or momentum because we've already filled in that gap with something that we've put there that God hasn't. What you fill that gap with matters and it's important. James Clear, who wrote a a book that was just kind of an instant classic on, on habit formation called Atomic Habits, which anytime I mention a book that's not 
explicitly Christian, I feel like I got to throw this caveat or this, this, this uh, disclaimer, thank you, in there. He may cuss in it. I'm not entirely sure, so if that offends you, you might not want to read the book. Um, but in the book, he says, true change is identity change. Improvements, uh, the, the things, you know, you could insert formation change. Improvements are only temporary until they become part of who you are. In other words, the right actions without the right mindset will not yield you the long-term results that you're wanting. That change starts with identity, knowing who you are. Well, the good news for us is that our identity isn't something that we have to create from scratch. It's something that we receive. It's not something we achieve. That whenever you become, whenever you surrender your life to Jesus, you receive a new identity. This, this identity isn't one that you discovered. It's not one that you earned. It's not one that you created. This is one of the, this is, you know, contrary to popular opinion, we don't get to make up who we are from scratch. Okay, whenever I was a kid, we were told, you know, you can do anything you put your mind to. And kids today are told you can be anything you want to be. You know, reality, biology, all of these things must bend to your, your will, how you feel. There's a quote H.H. H. Farmer said, if you go against the grain of the universe, you end up getting splinters. I think this is one of the reasons why we're dealing with such a crisis with mental health, is that mental health and the sense of identity are strongly connected and correlated. I would consider Jesus to be the most mentally healthy person that's ever walked the planet. And Jesus knew exactly who he was. He had a strong sense of identity. And I don't think it's coincidence. We have, if we want to think like Jesus, we need to know who we are. In that sense of, that the knowing who we are isn't something that we get to come up with entirely on our own. It's something that we learn from the one who actually made us. The one who actually created you is the one who can speak to your identity and who you are. In Christ, this is who you are. There's a list of, of things up there. So if you're wondering, you know, I'm not quite sure who I am, go through God's word and learn, discover who, you, who he's made you to be. You are a new creation. You are a child of God. Who you are in Christ is forgiven, loved, and free. You are a friend of God. You are called. You're chosen. You're more than a conqueror. This is who you are. And so if we want to live like Jesus, we need to think like Jesus. Jesus knew who he was, so we need to know who we are. Second mindset that we see from Jesus' response in answering the question of who are you is the purpose mindset. We see this in the statement of when you have lifted up the Son of Man upon the cross. Jesus didn't only know who he was, he also knew why he was here. He knew his why. Mark Twain famously said, the two most important days in your life are the day that you're born and the day you find out why. Purpose is hugely important. And I, you know, the, the day you find out why makes for a great, uh, makes for a great quote, but Honestly, your, your purpose is discovered over many days, years. It's this process of constantly learning what God has placed in you for the sake of the world. Look at these, these different verses that we see where Jesus expresses his purpose. In John 10, verse 10 and 11, Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. His purpose came out of his identity. I am the good shepherd. And so here's what the good shepherd does. His purpose came out of his identity. And so for us, that's why we have to start with knowing who we are because who, what we do comes out of who we are. If you are a child of God, as a child of God, what do I do as a child? 
I trust, I obey, I receive instruction. I take my needs and my requests and I make them known to God. I keep asking God, are we there yet? You know, I do the things that kids do. Uh, so many people, just on the, are we there yet thing. Uh, I've, I've seen this with people where they spend half of, they spend almost their entire life waiting to get there. Uh, and uh, there is no there, there is here. Okay, so like by that, here's what I mean. So many people are thinking, they spend their life thinking, man, whenever I get old enough, whenever I get older, then I'll be able to do these things. And then the other half of life, you're looking back going, man, if only I was younger. You know, you're, half your life you're too young, half your life you're too old, you know, just be present here. God works in the now, in the present. Luke 4, verse 43, again, Jesus says this. He says, I must preach, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God, for I was sent for this purpose. What's happening in this scene is Jesus has preached the good news of the kingdom and all the people who were there were saying, Jesus, you gotta stay here. Stay with us, keep doing these things, you know, I don't know if you've realized this yet or not, but people will put demands and expectations on you that God actually has different plans for you. And so Jesus says, listen, I've got to go like for, I, I'm motivated, I'm fueled, I must go proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God in other villages as well. Okay, for this was the reason that I was sent to this earth. Jesus didn't only know his purpose, but he was focused on his purpose. See, it's one thing to know your why, it's another thing to stay focused on it. And oftentimes, there's a, a quote that goes, uh, oftentimes the things that are most important, aren't all, they're not always the loudest. The things that are most important are, don't always shout the loudest. There's always going to be these these emergencies, these distractions that pop up. If the, the enemy can't get you sidelined with sin, then he'll get you sidelined with distraction and busyness. To subvert your purpose, all he has to do is get you distracted. You know, it, there's a, a Russian proverb, if you chase two rabbits at once, you'll end up catching neither one of them. So Jesus didn't only know his purpose, but he was laser focused on it. And also don't be discouraged whenever other people aren't as passionate about the things that you're passionate about. Okay, because that's not part of their purpose. So don't let that discourage you, stick with it. Also don't put the expectation on others that everyone has to be as passionate and excited about the things that you are. Okay, there's a reason why you're passionate and excited about it because God has put something on the inside of you. Again, we see Jesus, Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus saw that part of his purpose, part of his why was to be a servant, to serve others. And Paul picks this theme up in Philippians 2. I'll read it in the message. And now he, he says, hey, you, you know how Jesus set this example of humility and serving? That wasn't just Jesus. That's also for his followers. He said it like this. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. Amen. Other translations say, you need to think like Jesus. Because in the world, there's a, there's a narrative, right? That says, if you want to get ahead in life, here's how you do it. You push your way to the front. You make people the rungs in the ladder of success. If you, want to, if you want to succeed, it comes at this cost. And here, Paul's saying, that's how the world thinks, but the ways of God are not the ways of the world. 
that God can bring you favor and blessing. And he can put you in positions of influence without you having to step on people to get there. Don't be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is, Paul is telling them, be renewed in your thinking. Think of yourself like Jesus thought of himself. So if we want to think like Jesus, we're going to see that our purpose, our why comes out of our God-given identity and that he gives us these things. He puts this passion and this purpose on the inside of us, not just for our sakes, but for the benefit of others. Your, the purpose that he's given you is not just for you. It's to better the people around you. There's a series that we're going in, just a quick plug. On our midweeks right now, we're going through a series on the spiritual gifts and how everyone in the church God has given gifts to. And we're excited to help people discover and develop in those gifts. So uh, if you're not able to be here on Wednesdays, you can check them out on our YouTube channel, but I think that that would be super beneficial for the whole church to check out. Third mindset, I'm gonna call it the approval mindset. This comes from Jesus' statement, for I always do what pleases him, him being the father. From this, we see that Jesus was far more concerned about pleasing his heavenly father than pleasing other people. This mindset is gonna be tough for the people pleasers amongst us. How many of you would say, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a people pleaser, struggling people pleaser, recovering people pleaser? Yeah. Okay. You, you cannot make everyone happy. Okay. I really, really wish that we could. I really wish that I could make everyone happy, that everyone could like me. I would love that. The problem is that's not realistic. Okay. If God cannot make, the, God, the, the one who is keeping everything from just falling apart, if he cannot make everyone happy, you and I probably can't either, okay? On any given weekend, you have the farmer who's praying, God, please send rain. And on the same weekend, you have the bride of an outdoor wedding saying, God, please don't let it rain, you know? God cannot please everybody because people have different preferences. People have different opinions. People have different tastes. God can't please everyone, neither can we. Jesus didn't think about pleasing everyone, just the one. He knew that he couldn't make everyone happy. So as what he did is he valued pleasing God above pleasing everyone else. And listen, this, does, this is not uh, permission to be a jerk. Okay, when we talk about, hey, don't worry about pleasing other people, just worry about pleasing God, okay? In saying this, we're not saying, hey, you have the right now to be a jerk to people. Right. Here's why, because if, if you seek pleasing God, do you know what pleases God? Loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. Do you know what part of loving is? Is kindness. Love is patient and kind, okay? So when we seek pleasing God, we're actually going to, <laughs> we're going to be kind and patient one another, with one another because that's what pleases God. We're not doing it for their sake. We're doing it because that's what pleases God. Jesus chose obedience over the approval of others. When you're secure in your identity and you're secure in your purpose, you are free from the need to get your validation from other people. When you know who you are and why you're here, you are freed from the need to get that approval and to get that validation from others because you're secure in your identity and in your calling. I mean, think of the temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter four. The devil came to him and he, I mean, we, we've said this before and often, the devil probably didn't come to him in a red spandex jumpsuit and a pitchfork, okay? He probably came to Jesus in the same way he comes to us in here. And what was the temptation? Hey, if you really are, the son of God, prove it. 
How many times do we fall into a similar temptation? Hey, if you, are, if you really are this person, if this really is what God has called you to do, prove it. Instead, we're going to acknowledge that uh, the enemy is crafty and we're going to say, I'm going to let God be my defender in this. And as long as I'm obedient and faithful to what he says and with what he gives me, I'm not going to play the comparison game. I'm not going to play the validation game. I'm going to be content in being accepted by the Father. Jesus sought obedience over his own comfort. John 5.30, For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Oftentimes, whenever we are trying to please other people, the real issue is we're trying to remain personally comfortable. Okay? Jesus sought after, he valued obedience to his father over being personally comfortable. So I'm curious if there's anything that you aren't stepping into that you feel like God is inviting you into and you're not doing it out of fear of what others may think. It could be something as small and simple as in worship, lifting your hands. Uh, It could be something with your family. You know, it could be a wide range of things. But are you letting the opinions of other people keep you from stepping into what God is asking you to do? Maybe he's prompting it. You know, maybe you'll find yourself in a store or something and you you know he's prompting you. This person over here, you need to go pray for them. And it's like, God, can we do this like somewhere more private? You know, maybe when nobody else, the aisle that nobody else is on, why does it have to be the bread aisle? where everyone, come, you know, like, maybe I'll just play it and wait till it's, it's a little more discreet. Because in that moment, we're thinking about ourselves. Instead of, what would it mean to this person? I'm assuming that I'm actually hearing from God and that he has something that he wants to give them. Am I going to be willing to be obedient even if it's not comfortable? There was a word that came a couple months ago here that, was shared by a congregant. And the the phrase was this, be willing to be willing. Even if it makes you uncomfortable, be willing to be willing. Okay, the fourth mindset. I'm going to call it the presence mindset. And this comes from his statement, the one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me. Jesus knew that his father was with him. He lived his life from a secure relationship with his father. We see in his, right before his betrayal, John 16, 32, Jesus says, Behold, the hour is coming, and indeed it has come when you will all be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. This mindset, the mindset of God's presence always being with you, may seem like a minor one compared to knowing who you are and knowing why you're here. So it it may seem like not as big of a deal unless, of course, you have ever walked through the experience of abandonment, the experience of loneliness. Then you know just how significant this can be in the shaping of your life can have a huge effect. I want to share a story uh, that last week, and I have, I'm going to leave some of the, the details vague, but I, I have permission to, to share it. Last week in one of our, our <laughs> services in kids' church, you know, we go through the, with the kids, we'll go through the lesson, then at the end, we'll, we'll pray together with the kids. We'll get into smaller groups and, and they'll pray together. And listen, if you've never prayed with kids, you haven't lived life, okay? It, there's no telling what might be said. Some of it's going to be super powerful. Some of it's going to be like, I, I don't know if I can pray for that. You know, I'll never forget, just a quick side note, I'll never forget we were in LA on a mission trip one time and we were playing, praying with this group of kids. And one of the kids started praying and he was going through the Lord's prayer and he said, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and bring Michael Jackson back from the dead. 
And I was like, I was tracking with him. And then he said that and I'm like, I don't know if I could pray for that, buddy. You know, you just never know what kids are going to say. And so last week, one of the, one of the boys, he asked for prayer and his prayer request was, I want to see my parents. And this boy, uh, for about the past year or so has been in a temporary foster home situation. And his, the reason why he was there is because his, his parents were really struggling with substance abuse. And so they were unfit to, to care for him and his brother. And so he had asked, you know, I, I want to see my parents. And he had been in this temporary situation for about a year, but a few months ago, uh, you know, he had been told, hey, the, the house that you're in right now is just temporary while your parents work through, you know, trying to, to get their, their life back together to where they can care for you properly and everything. And a few months ago, a social worker sat down with him and his brother and told him, listen, your parents have officially lost custody of you guys and you're probably not going to be seeing them anytime soon. And so... As you might imagine, that being incredibly difficult for anyone to hear, but for you know a nine-year-old boy or however old, it's devastating. And so, after hearing that news, the the foster parents noticed a change in his behavior, and so did the you know the the babysit. Like with foster, you you have to have certified sitters to be with with the children. And so there was this couple who was approved to be able to, to babysit him and his brother to spend time with them. And they also started noticing this shift in his behavior because once he found out that he wasn't seeing his parents again, can you imagine, well, some of you don't have to try to imagine the thoughts, but the thoughts that start coming of no one, like if you If you want to make it in life, it's up to you. You've got to get tougher. No one cares about you. No one's going to stick with you. This is actually your fault. You know, all of these thoughts can start playing out in his mind. And what do we know? We know that our lives move in the direction of our strongest thoughts. And so these thoughts start to become feelings. These feelings start to become behaviors. And all of this is playing out and everyone can see it. And so on Sunday, he, said, he asks for prayer, I want to see my parents. What he didn't know was that the, the husband and wife that had been babysitting him and his brother had been in the background working their tails off to be able to do everything they can do to be able to adopt these boys. And on Tuesday, that couple goes into a court hearing and they couldn't, you know, with the rules and everything, they can't let the boys know their intentions to adopt them. And so the boys have been asking these babysitters, will you please adopt us? Please, like we have, we have nowhere else to go. Will you please adopt us? But they can't give them a response. And so on Tuesday, this husband and wife go in uh, to see a judge and the judge grants them the ability to tell the boys their intentions, that they can adopt them. So on Sunday, he prays, I want to see my parents. And on Tuesday night, he got to meet his new parents. And like just powerful moving. But since Tuesday, everyone, like all parties involved have noticed the shift in their behavior because they're no longer having to wrestle out. Now, obviously, there, there's still going to be a, a journey in, in this process with them. But they no longer are wrestling with these thoughts of, I'm out on my own. Like I've been deserted, I've been abandoned. You and I will never be forsaken by God because of what Jesus has done for us. On the cross, Jesus took upon himself the weight of our sin, the consequences of our sin, so that you and I could be adopted into his family. 
You are called, you are chosen, you are loved. God's, God's adoption triumphs over any sense of our abandonment. You have his name, you have his nature, you have his mind. And so what are we going to do? We are going to think like Jesus. We're going to think like he does. We're going to know who we are, why God's placed us here. We're going to know that, uh, that receiving the approval of God is more than enough, that we don't need validation from anyone else. And we're gonna know that even if everyone else around us walks away, that we're still not alone, that God is with us and that he is for us. And when we have those mindsets like Jesus, when we foster those ideas, when we're able to take thoughts captive and discern the lies of the enemy versus the truth of God's word, then what begins to happen is we begin to experience the fruit of God's spirit at work in our lives and our lives become transformed by Jesus. And it becomes a a sign to others that this thing is real and it is true and that it's available to them as well. This is, this is what's at stake. This is what's on the line with every single thought that comes into our mind. It doesn't seem like a big deal in the moment, but the thoughts that we nurture over time begin to shape our lives. This is why we have to be diligent in being careful how we think. As Proverbs 4.23 says, be careful how you think because your lives are shaped by your thoughts. So we're going to take our thoughts captive. We're gonna bring them to God and we're going to walk in the truth. And what happens when you walk in the truth? The truth sets you free. We walk in freedom. We don't have to be slaves to anxiety or negative thinking, all of these things that we've been talking about. But we can walk in freedom and in truth and knowing who we are and who God's made us to be. Does that sound good? Let's do that. Okay, if you would stand with me. going to invite our ministry teams to come on down to the front. If you need prayer for anything, uh, please come down and talk to these people. Maybe you're interested in following Jesus, surrendering your life to Him. I encourage you to come down. These people would love the opportunity to, uh, to pray with you, to help you uh, make that decision and, uh, and connect with you. So let me speak a blessing over you today, and then we'll be dismissed. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.